what are the main archaeological remains findings in Masada? Not, not as it relates to the mass suicide or even the siege, but that tells us about everyday life mm. on top of a fortress. Um, you mean during the time of the revolt or yes. or during the time of the revolt? Okay. Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, you know, we so archaeologically you can distinguish, you know, Masada Masada is a fairly easy archaeological site in the sense that it's not like a biblical tell with lots and lots and lots of layers that you have to dig through. So it's got a fairly, you know, um, compact history with fairly discrete phases, right? And two two really major phases, right? The time of Herod and then the time of the revolt. So, and most of the remains that we have date to, you know, those two phases. And obviously the majority of the remains that we have, especially when we're talking not so much about architecture, but about other finds like pottery and, you know, everything else dates to the very last phase, which is that, you know, dates mainly to the time of the revolt, right? There's also, again, that post revolt, you know, Roman garrison up there, but really there's a very significant, you know, sort of level of remains from, from the time of the revolt. Um, and so when Yadin was excavating, he, he found, you know, all of that evidence. And, and basically what he found was evidence that, um, hundreds of, of Jews, we don't know if there were 967, like, you know, that, that exact figure that Josephus gives, but clearly there were hundreds of, of Jews. And again, not all rebels, but just all different kinds coming and going who were crammed into the various rooms around the top of the mountain. So much so that in some cases they occupied or reused some of Herod's old palatial buildings for various purposes, but also had to sort of build their own their own quarters, you know, add their own quarters. And really what you get is kind of the effect of, of a shanty town. Um, you know, uh, in the excavations, they refer to these as ma'abarot, right? The transit camps from, you know, Israel in, in the 1950s. Um, and so what you find is particularly in the, the rooms of the casemate wall, um, you find lots of evidence of, of this occupation of these Jewish families, these Jewish refugees. And sometimes even where they would expand, they would build like these, these very thin, poorly built walls, you know, outside of the outside to kind of expand the area. It's kind of like, you know, I have an apartment in Jerusalem and you go around parts of Jerusalem today and you can see this phenomenon where you have these these apartment buildings, these, you know, long apartment buildings where you'll have porches added to the outside and then they'll add more to the outside. It's kind of like that, right? So so you find like these sorts of, um, you know, evidence of of really just people who were just refugees um, crammed into these into these rooms on top of the mountain, uh, lots of evidence of domestic activity, so cooking installations, things like you know stoves, for example, or some ovens, um, uh, evidence of like spinning and weaving, so everyday activities like that, um, and lots and lots of the kinds of artifacts that go along with that, storage jars, you know, for storing food or water or grain or oil, um, you know. Uh, other other items as well, so it's really fascinating. It's like a it's like a snapshot into um, sort of you know life as a Jewish refugee uh, on top of the mountain. And, and archaeological point of view, religious life for these refugees. Oh yeah, oh yes, absolutely. And it's clear that these were Jews. First of all, a lot of the ostraca, you know, the, the ostraca are you know, written in Hebrew or Aramaic and if Hebrew names, and you know, so a lot of the times, not always, but, um, and even some of them, sometimes we have people who are pre clearly or priests or, or whatever, but, but archeologically also in terms of artifacts. So we have, um, mikvaot, um, Jewish ritual baths, uh, on top of Masada. Yadin actually identified two of them that were installed, um, at the time of the revolt. Um, since then, other examples of, of mikvaot have been identified and exactly what is a mikvah and what is a not what is not depends on exactly which archaeologist you follow. But certainly there were more than a couple, the couple that Yadin originally identified. Um, and also things like um, stone vessels, which are very common at archaeological sites in the first century BCE, first century CE, and were used by Jews because according to um, the interpretation of biblical law, stone cannot become impure. 
through contact with something that is impure, right? It, it remains pure. Uh, so stone vessels become very popular and common at sites all over the country in the first century BCE, first century CE. And something that, that we know is quite common, but is hardly ever found because of the circumstances of preservation, we have some dung vessels on top of Masada. Because the, the, the principle that becomes accepted is that uh, vessels made of materials that are not transformed during the process of production uh, remain pure, even when they come into contact with something that's impure. So that's why stone, for example, would remain pure but pottery and glass would not, right? Because the material is transformed during production. Well, dung um, also, dung vessels also uh, did not, were not transferred, were, were not transformed during the process of production. They're just sun-dried vessels made out of, out of animal dung. And we know uh, from rabbinic sources actually that uh, dung vessels were, were used by the Jewish population, but we hardly ever find them because again, you know, after 2000 years, they just turned to mush. But because of the very dry conditions at Masada, we actually have some examples of dung vessels which, which were preserved. And again, they're the sort of thing that, that is not so surprising to find. Um, dung, there must've been some, uh, you know, pack animals on top of Masada. And so they would have, I'm sure that they were using dung for various purposes, including as fuel, but also the dung uh, would have been made into vessels, which then would have been considered um, uh, impervious to ritual impurity. And, and in terms of the manuscripts that were found, beyond the apocryphy, were there any other types of manuscripts found at Masada? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. There were, there were biblical uh, manuscripts that were found. For example, in the room that Yadin identified as a synagogue, which I think actually is a synagogue, certainly at the time of the revolt, which is basically a room in the casemate wall that had benches added to it uh, for assembly. Um, in uh, a, a room at the back of that, of that room, um, Yadin found a couple of biblical scrolls buried under the floor, which suggests that it was a Geniza. And those biblical scrolls uh, were Deuteronomy and Ezekiel. And then we have um, other scrolls that were found around the top of Masada. The, the main group comes from a room called the Casemate of the Scrolls, which is not far from the synagogue, actually. That probably was a dump from when the Romans took them out and they looted and they they dumped stuff. And so that room, and so that room also had some biblical scrolls. And I don't remember all of them by heart, but you know, it included Genesis, for example, and I don't remember, there were other works among there. So yes, absolutely. We do have uh, copies of um, biblical scrolls from, from Masada. Uh, 